All right, everyone. Welcome to Future Talks. Thank you all for joining us for our virtual Future Talks panel today. I am Marika Garay. I use she, her pronouns, and I am part of New Relic's social impact team, which we call newrelic.org. A couple housekeeping items before we get started. As a reminder, this is a public event with Relics and non-Relic community members present. As such, no confidential company happenings or details should be shared, but I encourage all participants to freely share questions and reactions to the information shared by panelists today on Instagram Live. Any questions for the panel can be shared through the chat feature on Instagram Live on our LinkedIn, oh, excuse me, LinkedIn Live on our LinkedIn event page, and we will capture them for panelists to answer as time allows. A small plug for our newrelic.org work as we open this talk as well. Through our community programs, newrelic.org is committed to driving more equitable access to technology. We focus on three main pillars of work. One is inspiring and equipping the next generation of technologists. The second is helping nonprofits build impactful technology to greater serve their members and communities. And the last, but very certainly not least, is enabling our employees to give back to their communities with intention and purpose. We are so proud to continue to bring this free virtual event to our community and seek to bring community leaders and partners and our industry peers and thought partners to the table during these events, as well as highlighting voices from our New Relic community who are doing incredible work on the topics we're covering. I'm very excited as such to introduce our panelists for this incredible conversation. Erin Diederich, who uses she, her pronouns and is representing newrelic.org, designs, oversees, and drives the strategy for New Relic's corporate environmental, social, governments, and social impact efforts. Aligned around a vision of creating more equitable access to technology, these efforts include employee volunteerism, like we just mentioned, and giving global community partnerships and product impact efforts, including the Observability for Good and New Relic for Students, which provide free access and enablement with New Relic. Prior to joining New Relic, she led corporate citizenship at NetSuite and designed award-winning employee volunteerism initiatives for Discovery Communications, now Warner Brothers Discovery. She has a journalism degree from the University of Maryland and lives in Portland with her husband and two kids. Shannon Farley also uses she, her pronouns and is the co-founder and executive director at Fast Forward and an experienced social entrepreneur. Before Fast Forward, she was the founding executive director of Spark, the world's largest network of millennial philanthropists. Prior to joining Spark, Shannon co-founded the W. Hayward Burns Institute, a MacArthur award-winning juvenile justice ref reform organization. Shannon holds a BA in American Studies from Georgetown University, go Bulldogs, and an MS in Gender and Social Policy from the London School of Economics. Marnie Webb, she, her pronouns as well, is the Chief Community Impact Officer for TechSoup and leads Caravan Studios, a division of TechSoup. In her role, she works with communities around the world to describe desired impact and to develop technology solutions that help move them forward towards their impact. That impact, excuse me. Her work is influenced by human-centered design principles, as well as methodologies from school, social work and international development, such as participatory action research. She has been working with the civil society, governments, academia, and corporations for more than 30 years to pull, put together teams and solutions that can accomplish big goals with and for communities. All right, panelists, thank you so much for joining us today. You all have such rich backgrounds on the topic that I'm excited to dive in with you all. Let's start with some background on where you all fit into the ecosystem of tech nonprofits. Marnie, can you share a bit about TechSoup and the work you do to support nonprofits around the world in their tech journeys? Sure thing. So TechSoup's mission is to help nonprofit organizations be able to acquire and use technology in meaningful ways. So in many instances, that means working with corporations to help manage donations or significant discounts to nonprofits worldwide. We help about 300,000 organizations a year through these programs. But it also means going in and training them and helping them think about 
technology. You know, everybody's solution wants you to store your data in their version of the cloud. So how does a nonprofit think about, well, where do I put that document actually? And how do I organize it? And how do I think about AI features that are being turned on in my tools and what that means for my community and my staff and our costs? You know, so we, we spend our time investigating those things and then helping describe it to organizations so that they can make good decisions and decisions that are meaningful to them. You know, um, we also will work with communities to design technology interventions that are very specific to the organizations. You, you know, and in, in those cases, it may be low code solutions that just help them better use the tools they already have, or it may be full code where we're actually going in and developing products that, that support communities of organizations as they work together. Incredible. Thank you for sharing, Marnie. And I just want to touch back on, on one metric, 300,000 organizations globally that, that TechSoup impacts. That's just incredible. Thanks through, for that, through, through that program, yes. Absolutely. Wow. Incredible. Shannon, your work at Fast Forward is situated in a different part of the tech nonprofit ecosystem, but equally interesting. Can you uh, introduce uh, our audience to Fast Forward's work? Yes, and thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here with you all. And I'm a user and lover of TechSoup, so I love being with Marnie whenever I can. <laughs> uh, fast forward, we want better tech applied to our biggest social problems. So we bridge tech nonprofits with the tech community to help accelerate those ideas. Tech nonprofits are nonprofit organizations that are using software or hardware to achieve their impact. Think Wikipedia, think Khan Academy. Fast Forward works with about 800 tech nonprofits globally through our programs and services. We're most well known for our startup accelerator. That looks a lot like accelerators you see in the for-profit world, like Y Combinator or Techstars, where we take early stage tech nonprofits and give them some money and some training and some love to get on their feet. We've had 79 teams go through the program, and those teams have gone on to serve over 39 million people and importantly, raise follow-on funding to help scale their visions. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing, Shannon. And I hope I'm not upstaging her in any way, but if you all have not watched Fast Forward's Demo Day with all of their incredible Accelerator cohort members, that is something you should absolutely go and find right after this talk, some of the most inspiring founders and game changers that I have ever heard from. But moving on to Aaron, uh, you're representing the new, you're representing New Relic on the panel today. Uh, can you start us off in this conversation by helping us understand a bit more about uh, New Relic's, NewRelic.org's pillars of work surrounding specifically nonprofit enablement? Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Marika. So um, New Relic has had a long-standing commitment, about 10 years now, to supporting nonprofits and getting the most out of our product. And for folks who aren't familiar with New Relic, we're an all-in-one observability platform traditionally used by a developer or a staff engineer um, at your organization to really be able to understand all of the different ways that your um, software and systems are running. And so, you know, we've long wanted to support nonprofits who have that need and ensure that they have access to our technology. In 2020, we formally launched our uh, Tech for Good program with Observability for Good, which is sort of the brand that we use to talk about the free access that we give nonprofits to our platform. We overhauled what we had been previously supporting nonprofits in and really focused on how do we expand this free access to make sure that nonprofits get the most out of our platform and are able to use it without too much expense because we know that budgets are really quite tight, um, especially operationally inside most organizations. So we support our 800 nonprofit customers, not just with this discounted and free product, which we partner with TechSoup and others to help get out into the world. Um, but twice a year, we also work really hard with employees across the company to put together teams who support our customers with pro bono work. So really thinking about what are the building blocks that our nonprofit customers need support in to make sure that they're able to use New Relic to its full capacity. Um, one of our favorite things about these pro bono programs is that it does allow us to really see 
employees from across the business partnering together and they get exposed to these amazing organizations doing great work uh, and get to give them this extra support and training and enablement. We knew that between those two things, we were just scratching the surface. There's so much more we could be doing. Um, we're really excited about supporting organizations like Fast Forward and TechSoup because we know that they're the ones who are out you know, on the front lines working directly with so many organizations and are able to really drive our knowledge and support what nonprofits really need um, as they think about their technology portfolio. And one of the things we heard through a lot of those partnerships was that what most organizations really needed beyond free products and support from employees was just money. They just needed, you know, money that was not earmarked specifically for programs that they could use to support operations. Um, and so last year we added an additional component to our program with the launch of our impact fund, where we each year grant out hundred thousand dollars to organizations specifically to support those backend technology projects that are, you know, things that organizations have just been really, really wanting to get done, but haven't had the funding for. Um, so those three pieces together, the free product, the pro bono services, and then the unrestricted dollars for technology needs are kind of the, the trifecta of how our organization thinks about our support. Incredible. And Aaron, not to put you on the spot here, but I think that we have an exciting, uh, announcement coming up later today on the latter topic of impact fund, don't we? We do. Yes. Stay tuned. Later today, we'll be announcing the four incredible organizations who are receiving grant support from us this year um, out of a really inspiring and really difficult to select from group of 200 um, who submitted just really creative and interesting projects to us. So um, we'll send that out. And we'll post it on LinkedIn Live for folks to be able to see which organizations and, and find out more about what they're building. Amazing. Well, thanks for letting me take that small tangent there. Um, but I want to pop back to one of Erin's um, pieces that she mentioned, right? Uh, in As we were discussing the NewRelic.org pillars of work central to the programming that she just mentioned, um, and specifically focusing on how to bring greater access to technology um, to nonprofits in need specifically. Marnie, I'd love you to speak a little bit more about TechSoup's work um, to bring tech training specifically to nonprofits across the world. Yeah, so one of the things that we think a lot about is how do we build a bridge between where organizations are and their specific needs for technology to the technology that's available to them. So much of the training is great, but it's really put inside a corporate context or it might assume something about the availability or training of resources that you have available to you. And so what we try to do is put a, put a lens on what we, we know is true, that organizations, even if they do have tech staff, they have more volunteers working mm -hmm. with their technology than they do have paid technology staff that, you know, they're not most concerned about their technology. They're most concerned about the people that they're there to support. I mean, there are, of course, a few exceptions that are tech nonprofits, but that's not most organizations. So we try to make sure that we're providing training and support in, the, in a meaningful context to those organizations and, and really start with their uses. What might be unique that a nonprofit needs, you know, or, or, or what might they be dealing with in terms of the way their funding cycles work or how they're working with volunteers instead of employees that, that might be unique and different from other training environments. In some cases, that means actually making the training and, and diving in. In other cases, it means curating the available training and providing an introduction that says, this is why we thought this one is really one for you to spend your time you know, with and on, right? So that they just have more context for why it's valuable. And we also do things like something we're doing with New Relic where we go in and help say what other tools might individuals that are using this be using? So we can think about them managing their digital stack and not just improving their fluency with one specific piece of technology. Mm -hmm. Incredible. And Marnie, when you and I chatted last week, you had a really interesting and insightful example about how um, some, some nonprofits can kind of think about technology use in a different way. And specifically, you you chatted about food banks a little bit and, and kind of using, do you maybe see as 
different from what we in you know places of tech or tech companies might think about. Can you touch on that a little bit more, the food bank example? Sure, sure. So one of the things that we have a small team of cultural anthropologists that actually interview nonprofit organizations, staff with nonprofit organizations, and then provide typical social science sort of coding methodology to understanding what the organization said. And our goal there is to understand how organizations perceive and talk about the issues that they face, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we found in talking with food banks, uh, food pantries more specifically, is that some of the changes that they made to adapt to COVID-19 were beneficial and they wanted to maintain, specifically the ability of their clients to be able to make appointments to pick mm -hmm. up they didn't talk about it as efficiency or cost savings. They talked about it as dignity for their clients. That was that was a hundred percent their language, um, and so they were looking for technology that could help them with that. What they didn't know is they probably already had that technology, whether they had it in the form of bookings on Microsoft or some of Google's tools or even Asana, because in in those instances they were wrapped in, a, in, a, in sort of a more corporate wrapper. So Bookings is a wonderful little tool that's included with Microsoft's Office Suite. You won't know it's there if you're not logging in online, which most of us mm -hmm. you know, don't spend their weekends like I do, which is like logging in and clicking all the buttons to see what they do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, um, so if you're just using Office the way you've always used it, you may not know that's there. And when you do see that it's there, it's, it's got very much the wrapper of setting up an appointment to talk to a consultant. Mm -hmm. You know, so what an organization needed to do to, to say, oh, that's actually solving my problem. And then a food pantry isn't actually a person, <laughs> you know, so what do I change on this to make the calendaring work? And how do I use buffers and everything else? It's a, it's a simple example, but it's a place where organizations may not always realize, oh, that I see how that meets my need. You know, and I think a role we, we can and do play is as a translator, right? How do we, we, we I think when you and I talked, I, I overused the bridge metaphor, but, but I think- <laughs> I think we built it. <laughs> yeah, how do we make that bridge to the organizations, but, but really do bring as much as we can towards them? We're not trying to meet them halfway. They're doing mm -hmm. important, valuable work on the ground. How do we get as close to that need as we can with how we train them to use technology and, and think about tech? Yeah, no, I, I love that, Marnie. Thank you so much for explaining that a bit more. And, and one more question for you, Marnie, and then I'll shift to Shannon. Um, you know, I think connected to that, what, what trends do we see for brick and mortar nonprofits or these nonprofits that aren't using technology as much but are on the ground doing the most incredible work? Uh, can you talk a, a little bit more about the trends that we're seeing with those nonprofits as they interact with bigger and bigger tech, maybe even things like AI? Yeah. So one of the big things that we, we see is as, there, as these nonprofits are moving on to more and more SaaS platforms, they may be losing track of actually what those tools are doing for them. The example I just gave is a great one. If you weren't, you, you know, it's it used to be that we had this regular cycle of publicity that told us all the new features that were about to come out in the new version of the tool that we had to buy and download, you, you know, and, and put onto our computers. Now it's like just Thursday and I have new stuff, you, you know, and if I'm not mm -hmm. looking through the roadmap of these companies, I might not even realize how it changed. Um, we're certainly seeing with AI terms of use changing. Um, one of the corporations that we work with just, you know, sent out some things. They're, they're not turning on some AI features for their clients that may be using HIPAA. We think some of those constraints also apply to nonprofits, even though they might not be using the HIPAA compliant version of the tooling. Mm. And so, again, part, part of what we think we need to do is provide that translation layer for organizations and, and make sure they know what's coming to them. The, the, the other thing that we see, of course, is they're under a huge pressure, as always, this isn't a new trend, um, to do more, more with less. Mm -hmm. And understanding how to do that when all the hype around AI is about doing more with less, but, but maybe not in ways that fit well with nonprofit organizations, with always, either their values, you know, how do they understand the, the details of the large language model that these tools are built on and what the limit of those data sets are for nonprofit organizations, I think you know, one of the things from the groups that Shannon works with in the accelerator that we've seen mirrored in many places 
is that they often don't have the underlying data. They're working in issue areas where data has not been collected in a standard ongoing way. So they may not always have that underlying data to talk about their change. How does that affect nonprofits as they're using tools that's built more and more on data that may not reflect the lived experience of the folks mm -hmm. that are, they're working with or, or even their own lived experience in some, some cases. We, we also know that nonprofit, org and we know this from our own research, that nonprofit organizations, um, what gets them to use a new tool is their old tool becomes obsolete. Mm -hmm. Another nonprofit recommends something to them. One of the hard things that we're seeing about the changing technology is it's not about old tools becoming obsolete. It's new ways of working and doing things, you, you know, but, but your spreadsheet still works. <laughs> you, you know, the, the on-premise way you may have done things or the on-premise like sort of modality you brought to doing your work, mm -hmm. it often still works you know, um, and so how do we help organizations think about changing? How do we take, for example, the things you were talking about, Aaron, the work that your volunteers do with organizations twice a year and write those up as case studies. So other organizations start to get something that feels like a recommendation from an organization like them to use technology in, in, in specific ways. Again, not necessarily a new trend, but one that's sort of made harder in this moment where we're going through a little bit of a sea change in technology and, and the complexity is increasing tremendously. Yeah, that's interesting. Almost seeing partners as consultants, which you know is, is not a, a validated approach at this moment, but I, I think would be very, very interesting to start really shifting and changing in that direction because you're absolutely right, Marnie. I think that's, that's one of the only ways that we can really help nonprofits understand the tools that they have available is, is seeing corporate partners or other community partners as, you know, validators and consultants on, on those methods. You're totally right. And maybe leading with how it's worked for other nonprofits and then following mm -hmm. up. That's, that's what we're seeing work yeah. more and more too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I do want to come back to this in, in a little bit. We have some questions coming up that will touch on this theme as well. But um, before we do that, Shannon, I wanted to shift to you, um, especially as we're talking about right this community-centered, design-centered approach. Many of Fast Forward's builders, founders, um, are not only incorporating these new technologies, as Marnie mentioned, into their work, but going further than that, making these technologies, specifically AI, um, a central part part of their everyday work and a part of the mission and vision of their organizations. Can you speak to how your founders and builders continue to center community needs and, and specifically also maybe continue, continue to center their own lived experiences as they you know, create these incredible organizations? Yeah, thank you for that question. We believe that proximate leaders are uniquely positioned to solve the problems they experience. Right, like if this has been something you've been facing your whole life, you're probably gonna have some pretty good ideas about what would fix it. Mm -hmm. So when we're selecting teams for our startup accelerator, our first screen is lived experience with the problem. Now that may mean some somebody who grew up uh, going to food pantries. It may be somebody who worked as a volunteer in pantries. Both of those are lived experiences that have insight into what's going on. But you really have to understand the problem to solve it. The thing about leading a tech nonprofit is that it's hard. It's like everything that's hard about a tech startup and everything that's hard about a nonprofit at the same time, we find founders with lived experience are deeply committed to the problem because it is theirs and they own it. Um, they also have others in their life that have experienced this problem. And so it's not just their personal experience, but their community's experience with which they're able to rely for great insight. And it makes a big difference into what they build. Actually, Marnie's example of food pantries is, is a perfect example. This is what tech nonprofits tend to be really great at is surfacing information that others didn't consider fully important. And you can Google food pantry and you'll get one or two answers, but you won't get the hours. You won't know if they take appointments. You won't know if they also have diapers. This, we have an organization in our portfolio called Lemon Tree that surfaces that information in Philadelphia, New York, and coming to a city near you. They use corporate volunteers to populate the data. Um, they use machine learning to clean up the data and make it usable for folks. 
it's really important that when people are seeking something as important and essential as food, that the user experience is immediate and dignified. And you can do that with great data and a great user experience. And really only someone who understood sort of the problems in the food system will be able to surface data as being a huge problem for hungry folks and communities. Mm -hmm. and, and specifically, I think someone who maybe, you know, was in line on, you know, at those food pantries or food, food banks, but also someone who worked at a food pantry or food bank. And I think that that's a, a really important lived experience that I'm not sure, Shannon, if you see, you know, any of your founders coming from the nonprofit brick and mortar sector themselves, but I would love to hear about that. You know, if there's any kind of pipeline between brick and mortar nonprofits and tech nonprofit founders. They've often had exposure to brick and mortar nonprofits. So in the lemon tree example, the founders had volunteered for soup kitchen mm -hmm. for many years and felt just disheartened when folks were waiting in line. I'm like, this is not what accessing food should feel like. And so got to know folks, understood the problem. They came from technology. So they had real insight into the power of the tools uh, and they built what they knew their users needed. That really beautiful coupling of technology and community-centered need. I love it. Amazing. Well, continuing on that thread, Marnie and Shannon, I want to talk briefly, or uh, not actually briefly, I want to chat for a, a bit of time uh, here about design and community-centered thinking uh, that we've been kind of circling in this conversation. Uh, so as, as TechSoup is a tech nonprofit itself, Marnie, um, and as Fast Forward Shannon, you know, works to define the space through its own incubation and other work, let's talk about how we merge those two separate languages, you know, uh, each of us, Shannon, you and I, and, and Marnie, you and myself as well, have talked about those different languages, and we chatted on it briefly here in this conversation too, the different languages of tech and community work, right? Marnie, I'll start with you, and then Shannon, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Uh, how do we merge those two different languages? I'm not sure that we do merge the two different languages as much as we provide a common space where we value the expertise of both groups. So one of the things that we've been thinking about, we've been thinking a lot about the people that are makers inside existing nonprofits and maybe making tools anywhere on the no code to full code stack that are meeting the needs of their organizations. So sort of what, what was often talked about in nonprofits is the accidental techie has become the accidental product. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you know, it's like, oh my God, I made this connection between these two tools using some script and, and now all of a sudden I own it and I have to keep it working because my organization depends on it in some way and I'm being asked to do other things. So mm -hmm. we've been focusing on what are the needs of these makers, whether they're technologists or whether they're de development officers inside of organizations or community organizers, you know, you know wh whomever they might be, but have technological imagination and start putting something together, sometimes in the sort of sophisticated way that ends up having an organization, a lot of resources around it, like the groups that go through the, the Tech Forward Accelerator and other kinds it, times it may just be some little product that's nested inside an organization that we never see outside of that organization. Mm. And so when we were t talking and thinking about it, we were very, in we, we again uh, brought, brought our team of cultural anthropologists to bear in doing the research and coding. And as all good projects start, uh, began with a lit review. And one of the things that we looked at in that lit review was a book called Power to the Public which is fantastic and has three ways of thinking about how you look at public good technology products. They talked about design, data, and delivery. And we thought that rubric was a really helpful one. We added impact and community because it's something we heard so much in the interviews with folks and, and was a source of pain in some cases for people that were making technology tools for inside organizations or outside them. But, um, what we were trying to do is, well, if we set that as, up as a rubric, it can, it can both be something that helps the makers go, oh, I do need a, a term of service. I do need to think about what support looks like, right, under delivery. I do need to think about where the data is housed and how I talk about privacy as part of data. I do need to think about public data standards and how I might be borrowing from them or contributing to them as part of my project, right? Mm -hmm. um, so both it, it could help organizations think about it. And on the civil society side, it could give them a tool for evaluating projects 
and thinking about those projects. So again, more than saying you guys have to understand each other, it's, it's saying, oh, how do we give you each a, a common thing to look at to be able to describe your product or improve your product on one side and to be able to understand whether or not you want to adopt it. And like, let's not pretend that we're all going to understand everything that's inside the technology, but instead say, just like I ask the doctor questions about my health all the time. I don't really understand, but I know what questions to ask and I know how to evaluate it. And I know what markers I'm looking for in my life and what matters to me mm -hmm. when, when I'm thinking about that to be able to make decisions. And so how are we giving sort of that kind of health check kind of thing, both to organizations and to the makers to give them a common place to, to, to talk about tools? I love that. Absolutely. Shannon, your thoughts. The world of technology has changed so much in the last 10 years. Uh, I think even the term maker can be a little bit confusing to folks that come from the brick and mortar nonprofit world. Most of the startups that go through Fast Forward's Accelerator are actually taking products that exist, New Relic and others, and they're bridging together a bunch of products and applying a new use case. They're serving a market failure with existing products. They aren't whole cloth creating new code. Um, that's a big difference. That wasn't possible 10 years ago in the same way that it is today. Like we have an organization in our portfolio called Talking Points. Talking Points is works with non-English speaking family members of kids in school so that those families can talk to their teacher, their kids' teachers. It turns out that more than zip code, more than income level, parental engagement is the number one difference maker in graduation rates. So they wanted to unlock that for folks who maybe for whom English was not their first language. So J. Lim, the founder, took Twilio and Google Translate and 5,000 bucks and basically developed the first beta version of the app and was able to deploy that in schools right away. Today, they're serving 14 million children and like over 100 languages. They're using AI to ensure that they're parents are getting the right responses from teachers that are most engaging. Like it's working. They do have a full suite of engineers today. Um, I was looking at New Relic's website this morning. It's not 25, but uh, which you would consider a small business, but they still, they have a bunch of people working on it. Uh, but it's different than we would, I think, as most people think of as a traditional tech company, you really are mm -hmm. using existing products. And I feel like that understanding and this is where TechSoup plays such a critical role. The understanding of what the different products do, how they speak to each other, and how you can use those projects in Symphony to serve a social use case is really important and honestly missing from most social sector conversations. Absolutely. I, I, I love all of these comments. Thank you so much for, for your additions here. Erin, I want to put you on the spot briefly. When we're especially talking about these two languages or these two kind of brain models, right? And then putting the employee engagement lens on things. How do we make sure that employees who are being are getting engaged in, uh, we like to call it employee purpose at New Relic, but other companies call it just overall employee engagement in social impact or community efforts, right? How do we help technologists who are working at our, our company, New Relic, or at other technology company, companies really understand the needs of these nonprofits that we're either partnering with, doing, uh, you know, community service events with, hoping to get donations for? How do we bridge that gap? Yeah, um, you know, I think there's, there's so many different things that are important about how we intentionally direct, you know, those of us that sit sort of in these corporate social impact roles, where I think of us often as the conveners, we're really pulling our resources together to direct our employees towards the things that we think that they'd be best suited to do. And then we're trying to pull our community partners into that shared space to say, you know, bring, bring the things that you need. Uh, and, and I think one of the most important parts about it is just setting the tone of kind of these like basic notions that we often forget of how important listening is, how important not jumping in and assuming you have the solution is, uh, but really listening to the needs of the organization 
that you're meeting with, listening to the, you know, maybe all the different constructs and barriers or opportunities that their organization creates, because the technology solution that you may have in mind, that would be your default thing that you're doing, you know, inside New Relic or whatever company, you know, the employee works at, it may not match, right? Like it may require a lot of different components that that organization doesn't need at that moment um, that aren't the right fit for them. And so really thinking and listening and asking questions and something I've often told employees who are getting engaged with nonprofits to support them through tech services is like, don't be embarrassed to pause and to do lots of term definitions for each other. There is some translation that has to happen in order for us to all actually understand the decisions that are available to us and what the opportunity is. And scoping out a project you're going to do with a nonprofit is so important to really say, like, I'm using these terms. Are we on the same page about what these terms mean? I'm hearing you use these terms. Like, can you define for me what that means for your organization? Um, because it may be quite different than the assumptions that we're making. And I think one of the pitfalls of volunteer projects of all kinds is well-meaning individuals who rush into a situation, sure that they've got the answer, and they just start doing without stepping back and defining, scoping, asking the questions and making sure that the thing that they're excited to do for the organization is actually what the organization needs. Um, and so as a social impact professional, I feel like a huge part of my job is just trying to help everybody, you know, bring that additional thoughtfulness to their conversations and then, you know, pushing people kind of together, finding those intermediaries who can connect them, who can who can really make sure that the translation happens and make sure that the project is well scoped and ready to go. Mm -hmm. Very well said, Erin. Thank you so much. And, and I would just very briefly add to right, helping folks understand the lived experience as we've touched on in this conversation behind the organizations and, and really the lived experiences and the stories that illuminate the problem or, or the, the issue that needs to be tackled from either a tech nonprofit or a brick and mortar nonprofit perspective, right? Helping these employees of tech companies or really any other type of company understand what's behind the organization itself and, and why there's a need and, and why there's, you know, that that uh, equation that needs to be solved. Thank you so much for those thoughts, Erin. Um, I, I wanna chat a bit more right on, on the main theme defining this talk, tech nonprofits and the trends we're seeing in this space. Uh, for all the technologists, change makers, we, Shannon, you mentioned makers in general, builders on this call, I wanna hear from the entire group, all three of you, what are your thoughts on the most important trend to keep your eye on in the tech nonprofit space? Let's start with Shannon. AI is gonna change everything. Um, my experience comes from brick and mortar nonprofits. And when I think about my first job at like a legal aid clinic, um, if you were starting that legal aid clinic today, because of the cloud revolution, you would need about half the employees and you could far more efficiently achieve your impact in the world. Mm -hmm. We know what cloud meant for corporates. Most, tech, most nonprofits, even brick and mortar nonprofits have engaged in cloud in some way, not all of them. This coming revolution of AI has been happening in corporations for like 10 years, but really hasn't trickled into the social sector until we've seen these new UX use cases of AI like ChatGPT and BARD. AI is all about accessing information in a new and different way. And that's what tech nonprofits are really good at. And so there's this moment of opportunity for tech nonprofits who understand the technology can play in the sandboxes to ensure that they are building things that serve the most vulnerable populations and that they're part of the conversations. Because those folks have largely been left out of the cloud revolution in the last 20 years. So how do we take lessons from that and apply it to AI? We are excited about AI because we feel like it can revolutionize health and human rights and access to democracy. We're also concerned about data and privacy and what that means. Um, 
but we truly believe that the only way to ensure that the most vulnerable are represented with dignity is to get them in the sandbox and start building. I love that, Shannon. Thank you. And before I, um, I ping over to Marnie, Shannon, can you talk a little bit more about that sandbox that you just mentioned and your thoughts on kind of keeping the sandbox small to ensure that, you know, when we're talking about data and privacy and security, we're really, you know, making sure that we're centering the community in need. Yeah, again, like most of our organizations that are leveraging AI, AI now and are building products that use AI are using open source existing services and they're bridging it together to new use cases they're nervous about what's going to happen with their data in large language models. So they're creating some um, barriers so that that information, uh, certainly the private information that's necessarily private is protected. That does create some limits in the models. And so that's something that we as a community are spending a lot of time thinking and writing about now. How do we empower people to play with these new technologies in contained environments before they release them widely? Um, actually, Conmigo is a great example of this. Conmigo is this new AI-based coach that Khan Academy released. It's really amazing. Uh, you can see how it could revolutionize schools. It's also super expensive right now. It's like 200 bucks a license. So not all schools would be able to afford that or families for their kids. Um, but there is this real opportunity and you can see a future in which the price will go down and we've learned a lot and we've protected the identity and dignity of children while they're using it. So it's small today. It's only going to get bigger, but also the technology is going to get better. So there's a real opportunity to imagine massive impact if we're smart about how we deploy it these days. Most definitely. I love that, Shannon. Thank you. Marnie, your thoughts on uh, the most important trend to keep your eye on for tech nonprofits? Yeah, 1,327%, what Shannon <laughs> just said, actually. Um, I, I, I do think the, the generative AI and the large language models upon which it is built are going to be, they're going to change a lot of things for technologists and for nonprofits in general. I'm, I, I just to maybe add on so that I'm not so much repeating all the great things Shannon said, because I agree with that a, a thousand percent is that or a thousand three hundred and twenty seven percent. And um, is the um, th this work that a woman named Emily Bender at the University of Washington has been doing around data statement. She's actually a linguist and she's talking about how you can make community data statements around some of the large language models. She's been working on this for a while, starting with natural language processing. So you understand where the models came from and what their limits are. So that's the idea about the data statement. Like, when is this going to start breaking down for me? Because it, it was built on what people were writing on the internet, which may not include the people that I'm serving. It may not include the language that they speak in. It may not include the experiences that they're having. You know, so, so how do I understand the limits of that? I think there are opportunities within that for us to identify places we might want to put together little language models that are more specific to nonprofit organizations. I think when we start looking and applying that outside of kind of text-based generative AI, how do we think about organizing data collaboratives or data trusts that give us better data for modeling out predictive future scenarios. Like we've all looked at climate change scenarios that say we're gonna run out of water in this year, or the world is gonna get the, you know, this temperature at this time. Um, and that's built on pretty robust data, but also a set of assumptions mm -hmm. that go into making that model. It's a view of the world of what's gonna change or not change. The, the predictive quality of what comes out of it is only as good as the data and the assumptions that built out that model. So how can how can we, like organizations like Shannon, like mine, others in the sector, provide support in actually making sure that we're contributing data into those models for, from the organizations that we're working with, protecting privacy, um, somewhat obviously, and and also that we uh, understand what the limits are when they can't include the data of the folks that we work with our own data. I mean, you know, if you're doing 
modeling about you know the health of different communities in Uganda right now, it's necessarily not going to include LGBTQ individuals because of the legislation that's going through that country. We're not going to suggest just put that data in there because that's ridiculous. You, you know, you know that's unsafe. Mm -hmm. So we know that that health studies that may come out over a period of time that are that are from data there is going to have a limit. Let's make sure that we're well describing what those limits are because they may be unique for the organizations that we serve and the people that we work with. And I think that's our job to be take on a kind of consumer reports function, right? That that says we're not looking at what makes a car safe or unsafe. You know, but but we are saying that this is what makes these different data models or these different assumptions that go into predictive modeling we think beneficial or potentially problematic. Absolutely. And for anyone else who's fur furiously scribbling down all of these incredible recommendations for reading that Marnie is offering, that was Emily Bender from the University of Washington on uh, data limitation models. So thank you so much, Marnie, for adding that in there. Um, Aaron, I, I want to switch to you here. Uh, your thoughts on the most yeah. important um, I mean, I, I think I have to, of course, 1,327% agree. Maybe sort of um, foolish to overlook the enormous opportunity that AI is going to bring to the social sector. So I think the the flavor of the answer that I'll, I'll add to this um, to make it not redundant is to say that I think there is a great opportunity and one that I'm really hopeful we will see of funders, corporate folks, individuals, seeing AI as an opportunity for them to direct funding to, to ensure that the social sector has you know, the opportunity to sit down to actually understand what AI can mean for their organization, mm -hmm. has access to training, has time and capacity to take on training to understand the opportunities. Um, I think sometimes when technology shifts and changes so quickly, you have kind of the innovators who are so excited for it, who've been watching it and who are like on it immediately. And then you have a lot of folks who are overwhelmed and who, you know, see something changing, see, see, see that there is going to be a new opportunity, but don't know how to make the space in their already completely overwhelmed world to focus on it, to bring it into their current strategy, to build the roadmap. Um, so what I would love is if, you know, we could find a way to direct funding, find a way to direct time and pro bono services to support organizations carving out that time and that space to be able to really understand the opportunities of AI to kind of not feel the overwhelm of it, but be able to feel like they see the opportunities and they see the risks and they know how to manage them or they, they can vocalize the people they're going to need to join their team, to support them in order to use it to the, the most advantage for what they're doing. Because I think there is just this incredible opportunity, but with that, you know, there's risk. And for a lot of folks, risk is so overwhelming um, and, it, it can make you shy away from embracing new technologies. Uh, and I would hate to see people miss the opportunity to use AI to further their organizations because they don't have the time and the space to really understand and get equipped to know how to train their, their fellow staff members of what it means to use a chat GPT bot you know, in their day-to-day -day work, which data they can and can't use, like how to approach those new tools. Um, and how to make those tools really sing for the organization, because it, it, it will be a great, uh, I think 10 years from now, we'll be just having such a different conversation about this um, and have some really amazing examples of from a brick and mortar organization to a fast forward accelerator organization, what we're seeing AI do to really revolutionize how we're able to get services out to communities in need. Mm -hmm. Could I use a cool example that this just happened? Yeah, please. Yeah. So we have an organization that just graduated from our cohort called Road to Uni. It's started by a woman, Cielo. She's a first generation college student. Uh, she is a dreamer, came over and really didn't understand anything about the 
college process. She got into one of the fancy dancy programs, like a prep for prep, uh, where they do everything you need to go from elementary school to get kids into college. And it just burned in her heart that only like 100 kids a year ever got that service. So all through college and out of college, when she was a one-on-one -on -one college counseling tutor, she was meanwhile answering kids' questions on Instagram. Like uh, tips and tricks about how first-generation underrepresented kids could get into college. She started Fast Forward's Accelerator program with the vision of an app that would take all those answers and coach kids through the college process. Now, if you were building that organization even two years ago, an app makes a lot of sense, right? But it's pretty expensive. It would cost probably $250,000 to get off the ground between design and data and protection. You need a lot of staff. Well, during the accelerator program, ChatGPT4 opened for all of us. And she realized she could take all the messy data from her Instagram answers and put it into a chatbot that could do about 90% of what she was doing in person. So in about a month's time and a $20,000 investment, she was able to launch Road to Uni's chatbot. I put it here in the chat. You can check it out. It's really good. It's not perfect yet, nor is any tech product, honestly. Uh, but she's on the back end. She and her volunteers to answer questions if things aren't landing. And it can always escalate to a human if you need more support that the chatbot can't provide. It's a great resource for a small organization because it's open all the time and they're constantly improving answers that kids need right in the moment. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's scary and it's a little bit unknown, but it could be cheaper, it could be faster, and it could be more impactful if we experiment in safe sandboxes to get it done. Yep, exactly. And safe and small sandboxes that can then expand as needed and as the data helps them to. And Marnie, I do want to touch on um, something that you and I chatted about last week, because I think this is such an important piece of both the work that we're talking about now, where, you know, tech nonprofits are using AI, chat, GBT, really incredible new um, tech features to be able to expand their work, make it faster, easier, less expensive. Um, but you had mentioned something that was really important, I think, for folks to keep their eye on. And that's the, uh, you know, unique voice that so many brick and mortar nonprofits have specifically with it situated within their communities. So can you chat about that for just a little bit? You know, how you continue to uh, help nonprofits use that unique voice in this larger ecosystem of, you know, chat GPT and generative AI? Yeah. I, I mean, I think there are a couple of things. One of the things that we see with these small organizations, what we're calling brick and mortar organizations, but I'm just going to put a little bit more definition around that and say, I'm talking about grassroots organizations that have budgets of under $1 million USD, no matter what country they're situated in. They see problems before they surface generally often. They see it in their community because they experience it. They may be responding to it because they don't see anybody else in their community responding to it, right? Whenever they go in and they use generative AI tools via the prompt and chat GPT, they're accessing um, information that's built on data in a model that's probably two years old, right? Depending on how they're using these tools. So they're ahead of the content in more than one way. They're ahead of the content in like time, but they're also ahead of the content in they're dealing with people who, again, lived experience may or may not be included in there. I think this is a place where a lot of the service we can provide those kinds of organizations is support in writing good prompts. Like how do I write a prompt that's more likely to get me back the kind of content that I need if it's available? And how do I think about how I edit and change those, those prompts? How do I keep becoming sort of plastic content all over the internet be that becomes this self-reinforcing closed loop, right? I, I, write, I write a question in chat GPT. I get an answer that looks pretty good. I publish that. That becomes part, both my question and that answer becomes part of what the next version is trained on, right? That loop gets in some ways smaller if organizations aren't taking that information and going in and editing it. Mm -hmm. If they are providing in their prompt the, the detail that lets them get back a higher quality answer than they might get from the internet as a whole. And you know, many of us have seen some of those 
uh, horror stories. There was an article in The Guardian uh, maybe three months ago around an organization that supported young people with eating disorders using chat GPT, using, I shouldn't say chat GPT because I actually don't know that that was the tool, but using generative AI. And you, you can imagine that what's published on the internet as a whole about how we, a young woman should eat may not actually be aligned with the message that that organization <laughs> was, was trying to give to its clients, right? And the people that it was working with. And so I just, I, I think organizations need to be really conscious of the editing process. I think there's this enormous democratization potential with just writing good, clear English language sentences that we get from that at speed. But I think we should think of it as a great first draft. You, you know, what we get back. And, and I also think that where we can, it puts an even bigger burden on us as organizations to publish in our own voices, whether we're publishing data, whether we're publishing a blog, blog post, whatever we may. And, and, and maybe on the independent web, maybe under URLs that we own and not just our LinkedIn pages or our Facebook pages or our Instagram accounts. Those are great and wonderful tools for connecting with people. But maybe we also need to be publishing outside of that so, so that in a small way even, we can influence those models as they go forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think an actually fantastic um, example before we move on to our last question here in our last couple of minutes, fantastic example of how AI can be used to make it easier and faster to provide information to a nonprofit's um, clients and, and community really is actually a fast forward accelerator member, uh, Career Village. They have an amazing, and I cannot say enough, I've used it many, many times as a careervillage.org advice giver myself, but you know, their AI bot is unique that in that it says, hey, what type of, um, what type of advice do you want to deliver? Do you want to deliver it in this way, this way, or this way? You're able to select that. The bot gives you your, you know, potential advice that you can write, write. And then Career Village has enabled an edit feature. And so you can always edit the advice that you are giving to a student or a professional job changer, whatever the audience is, you're able to edit what the, the bot has kind of spit out for you on careervillage.org. And Shannon, I'm sure you have just the most amazing things to say about them, but I love that as the kind of edit example that we can use with AI. And I think they're such a great example, not just because of the impact they're having, but actually their depth of data is incredible. It's, it's not a small sandbox. They have had no. professionals answering questions on Career Village for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so they have great qualified answers. And you've always, because this was really important to the founders, Jared and Jen, you can always up and down vote how mm -hmm. good an answer is. So there's been editing and quality control from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So we keep using the word small, and I just want to say that it's not all small. Some of these folks are using huge troves of data that they've developed as nonprofits, as social sector activists um, mm -hmm. over the last few decades. And it's a powerful tool to have contextualized, verified answers. Absolutely. And just another shout out, careervillage.org is an incredible, incredible place to be able to offer advice to career changers, students alike. Um, and I cannot say enough about the impact that they're able to make. But as we close out in these last two minutes, and apologies that we will not have time to answer any audience questions, but I love all of the, you know, the answers and the thoughtful, thoughtful feedback that the three of you have given to these questions that we've offered here. Thank you so much for your thoughts. And you know, as we close out, I want to specifically call out uh, the action that each of us on this call can take to make space uh, for tech nonprofits and towards a more equitable um, and accessible community, right? How can we, as everyday people on this call, whether we're technologists, philanthropists, community members who are just tuning in, how can we get involved in helping to drive that mission of equitable access to technology? Erin, I'd love to start with you. Sure, I think I'll, I'll bring back a few of the greatest hits of things you talked about, which is, you know, identify the organizations that really speak to you, the things that you personally care about and are passionate about, find organizations doing that work and listen to them, understand mm -hmm. their needs 
and you know offer the resources that you have available. If that is financial resources, that's awesome. Think about your financial resources going in an unrestricted pool to, to, to an organization so that they're not earmarked explicitly to a certain program area, but they can be used for things like technology. If it's your, your time and your skills, um, look for you know organizations that need help with their technology, ask questions, meet people that are working there and ask them what they're struggling with and find the place that you think you have an opportunity to really support while listening, support while hearing the needs of the organization. Um, I think these AI examples are perfect reminders for us of sometimes going fast because the technology is immediately available is great. Sometimes it's so fraught with problems because you might read that answer that comes back to you as a volunteer and go, yeah, that sounds great. And press it out into the world without checking with a counterpart at the organization who really knows the context and saying to them, hey, here's the first draft. Does this make sense to you? Is this really the message that we're looking for? Does this help our constituents? Getting that more, you know, accurate information before you press publish in your volunteer job just gives you the opportunity to support ensuring that the right information goes out into the world that becomes the next data set. So use your time, use your money, use your resources and listen really hard uh, and, and pause before you go too fast, but make sure that you're, you're finding the organizations that you care about and supporting them as much as you can. Absolutely. Marnie, your thoughts? Uh, I think on the organization side, be open to those volunteers, like talk to them, engage them in meaningful ways inside your organization and show up for them in the same way they're showing up for you. I mean, they're there to help you on the ground, but it requires you talking about what you need and maybe being willing to be a little bit uncomfortable and trying some new things. And, and think about this, this thing that you're not just improving your existing processes, you also may be changing the way you're working and providing support. Mm -hmm open up opportunities that can be hard to see from the place you are now. I love that. Thanks, Marnie. Shannon, close us out. Nice. Uh, our accelerator application is open until September 30th. So if you have a tech nonprofit idea burning a hole in your heart, come join us, apply, share it widely. We need better technology applied to our biggest social problems. The problems are getting bigger, technology is also getting better. So we need smart folks working on it. And we hope those smart people are you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone. Erin, Shannon, Marnie, it was a joy to have you in this conversation. This was Future Talks, exploring uh, tech nonprofits. And I am so thankful for everyone for tuning in. If you have uh, you know, a minute to watch after the fact, or if you want to send this to a colleague who wasn't able to join, just click on the LinkedIn event page. This will be available forever or until the internet stops. Uh, you'll be able to watch this again and again and again and send it to your colleagues. Thank you so much for everyone for joining. We really appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.